This is part two in our Lay Hero series. We're reading Nehemiah's memoir, both because it's very interesting and because in it we find five principles for lay heroes. Lay people, like yourself, that God uses to make a significant difference. At the end of part one, I left you with a question. I, I said this, you may not see yourself as a lay hero, but what if God does? What if God what if God wants to overcome your lack of qualifications and your lack of resources and your hesitancy to, to live with a heart that hurts? What if God wants to make a difference through you? And what if God wants to do this in a way that you see and experience a side of Jesus that many people miss? What if when God looks at you, he sees a lay hero? Well, we're going to continue in Nehemiah's story today and find the next thing that a lay hero would do. Verse 4 of chapter 1. When I heard these words, I sat down and wept. I mourned for a number of days, fasting and praying before the God of the heavens. I said, Lord, the God of the heavens, the great and awe-inspiring God who keeps his gracious covenant with those who love him and keeps his commands... Let your eyes be open and your ears be attentive to your servant's prayer that I now pray to you day and night for your servants, the Israelites. I confess the sins we've committed against you. Both I and my father's family have sinned. We have acted corruptly toward you and have not kept the commands, statutes, and ordinances you gave your servant Moses. Please remember what you commanded your servant Moses. If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and carefully observe my commands, even though your exiles were banished to the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place where I have chose for my name to dwell. They are your servants and your people. You redeem them by your great power and strong hand. Please, Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to that of your servants who delight to revere your name. Nehemiah's prayer basically went like this. It started with, God, you are, right? God, you are the awe-inspiring God. God, you are the great God. God, you're the God who keeps his commandment. God, we don't always keep our commandment, but you do. And then he moves on and, and Nehemiah prays, God, please be attentive to my prayer. And in the middle part, he says, God, you were right. You were right to exile us. We were unfaithful to you, and we broke the covenant. But then as he comes down the back end of his prayer, Nehemiah says, well, we are returning to you now, God. So please remember your promise to restore us. But then, Nehemiah's prayer takes an unexpected turn. Let's see how he finishes his prayer. This is verse 11, the second half. Give your servant success today and grant him compassion in the presence of this man. At that time, I was the king's cupbearer. Nehemiah says, God, give, give me success and give me favor in the eyes of this man, this man being the king, King Artaxerxes, that he works for. Nehemiah, you could say it this way, Nehemiah is praying, said, God, give me an opportunity to do something. Give me an opportunity to go to the king and ask for an opportunity to do something about this problem. Nehemiah isn't just praying that God will fix the problem. Nehemiah is praying, God, give me your servant success today. Give me compassion in the presence of this man. I'm going to ask for an opportunity. And that, that's a principle for us. The, the lay hero principle of part two is this. A, a lay hero prays for an opportunity to do something about the problem. A lay hero prays for an opportunity to do something about the problem. In the book Visioneering, talking about this passage, it says this, Dreamers dream about things being different. Visionaries envision themselves making a difference. Dreamers think about how nice it would be for something to be done. Visionaries look for an opportunity to do something. Clearly, Nehemiah is acting more like a visionary. Nehemiah prayed for an opportunity, even though there was nothing he could do about the problem. I mean, think about it. He wasn't free to move to Jerusalem. He wasn't a wall builder by trade. He wasn't recruited by the citizens or leaders there. They didn't come to him and say, well, Nehemiah, please, please come help us, right? And on top of that, the king had previously ordered the wall repairs to be stopped. Nehemiah didn't have enough money or resources to make a difference. And so you got to ask this question. Was he crazy 
I mean, was Nehemiah crazy to pray like this? God, give me an opportunity to do something when he's so far away and isn't invited, doesn't have necessarily the skills maybe. All he's got is, like we talked about in part one, tears. Was he crazy to pray like this? If you're a 10th grader and you're listening to me, if you're a 10th grader or, or you know, maybe a little older, a little younger than that, but you're a teen and you're bothered by something that isn't right, would you be crazy to pray for an opportunity to do something about the problem? I mean, you don't have any resources, really. You, you can't go anywhere. You can't even drive, right? Are, are you crazy to pray, God, give me an opportunity to do something about this problem? Hear me well. No, no, that's not crazy. Praying when you don't have much by way of resources or skills or talent or treasure or whatever, praying for an opportunity, that, that's not crazy. Crazy, crazy is thinking that God let you feel the wrongness of the situation for no reason. That's crazy. Crazy is only wishing things were better. That's crazy. But praying, a lay hero kind of prayer, God, give me an opportunity to be part of the solution, that's not crazy. Back to that book I mentioned, Visioneering, he went on to say, if you're a parent, you probably have a vision for your children. And instead of simply praying that they would become men and women of character, pray for opportunities to build their character, right? Build character into their lives. Your vision involves you. You have a role. You have a part to play. If you have a vision for unbelieving friends, don't simply pray that they'll be saved. Pray for an opportunity to speak to them about Christ. If you pray for an opportunity, more than likely you'll recognize it when God brings it along. So I want to encourage us to pray a God-honoring lay hero prayer. Here's an outline of what that might look like, a God-honoring lay hero prayer. It has three parts you saw in Nehemiah's prayer. God you are a great vision for what to change in this world often starts with a great vision of just how great our God is. I remember reading Dallas Willard. He talked about that. He says, God loves to use people. I'm paraphrasing him, but he says, God loves to use people who have a vision, but that vision is a, a vision how good God is and how great he is and how good he is to let us live in his world. So a God-honoring Lahiro prayer begins with a, God, you are, you're great, you're kind, you're a good creator, right? That kind of thing. But then moves on, God, here's the situation. Here's what's going on. Here's what's, here's what's playing out. Here's the situation. And this isn't what you want. And I know it's not what you want, God. This is not your will that's being done here. That's the second big part of a lay hero's God-honoring prayer. God, here's what's going on. And this isn't okay. This is not okay with you. It's not okay with me. And then third, God, please, please give me an opportunity to do something about it. And, and, and the prayer, I think, continues with what it, you'll need in order to be able to do something. Whether it's some connections, some other resources. God, give me an opportunity and, and you fill in the rest of it. So Nehemiah prayed the prayer, right? Did he get his opportunity to ask the king for an opportunity to do something about the problem? Well, let's see. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 1. During the month of Nisan in the 20th year, uh, King Artaxerxes. Quick time out. Uh, 20th year, this would be April 445 to 444 BC. Um, this is four months. Nisan is four months after Nehemiah heard the news and began praying. Uh, so you might wonder, well, like, why the delay? I mean, he heard it in Chislev. Why, why wait four months? Well, there have been a lot of theories out there. I'll throw out a few of them. Uh, one, the king might have been at the other palace. Susa was the winter palace. Uh, so the king might have been away. That's a possibility. Uh, second, the king might have been in a bad mood or might just not have been a good time. The king was, you know, planning other big things or whatever. And so clearly timing is everything, uh, that kind of thing. And speaking about mood, um, it was not uncommon to ask the king for favors when you knew he was in a great mood, like at his birthday or something like that, having a big celebration. Um, it could be that Nehemiah was preparing 
but he didn't have all his ducks in a row yet. He didn't know what, everything he needed to ask yet. And so that's a possibility. Uh, it could be God was taking this time to just kind of confirm in, in Nehemiah that this wasn't just an emotional response that he had back then, but this was something serious. It was a, it was a burden that wasn't going to go away. I don't know. It could be any of those things. It might be something entirely different. What I know for sure is it's four months later. All right. So during that month, Nisan, 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was set before him, I took the wine, gave it to the king. I had never been sad in his presence. So the king said to me, why do you look sad when you aren't sick? This is nothing but sadness of heart. I was overwhelmed with fear and replied to the king, may the king live forever. Why should I not be sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? And the king asked me, what's your request? We're told traditionally that, uh, yeah, you were not allowed to be sad in the king's presence. But it, uh, so that would explain why Nehemiah was you know, overwhelmed with fear. Because it, this is a death penalty kind of offense is what we've been told. But um, perhaps it would come to that point where Nehemiah he just couldn't hide it anymore. It was eaten away at him. And the king saw it perhaps with God's help, right? King saw it. King said, what's going on? Nehemiah blurts it out there. Uh, sadness is the right response, King. Because the city where my ancestors are buried in, that's ruins, his gates are destroyed by fire. And so the king says, what's your request? And just like that, Nehemiah has his opportunity to ask for an opportunity to do something about this. And what you'll see next is a wonderful example of what I call a clear ask, right? Very plainly, very clearly ask for what it is you're hoping for. Verse 4, the second half. So I prayed to the God of the heavens and I answered the king. I love that. If it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor with you, send me to Judah and to the city where my ancestors are buried so that I may rebuild it. The king with the queen seated beside him, asked me, how long will your journey take and when will you return? So I gave him a definite time and it pleased the king to send me. I also said to the king, if it pleases the king, let me have letters written to the governors of the region west of the Euphrates River so they will grant me safe passage until I reach Judah. And let me have a letter written to Asaph, keeper of the king's forest, so he'll give me the timber to rebuild the gates of the temple's fortress, the city wall, and a home where I'll live. That's a clear ask, right? You ask him for a leave of absence and he knows exactly how long, right? It's a specific amount of time. He's asking for travel permits. He's asking for timber. He's asking for housing, right? No, ne Nehemiah, you think about this. He, he knew how long he was going to be gone. He knew the name of the guy in charge of the forest, Asaph there, right? He, Nehemiah had planned for this moment. He had planned for this moment that God was going to give him the opportunity that he was asking God to give him. And God was going to give him that favor for the king. And so he was planned, prepared for that moment. Well, how did it turn out? Verse 8, second half. The king granted my requests, for the gracious hand of my God was on me. I went to the governors of the region on the west of the Euphrates, gave them the king's letters. The king had also sent officers of the infantry and cavalry with me. And so it began. So it began. You ever play, you know, with somebody else or just in your own mind, a little game of what if? Like you wonder, like, what, what if I hadn't done this? Or what if I had done this? We, we were recording a vi another video this week, and I, I had huge blooper in it, but we didn't realize it until after it was all done, and the other people I was recording with had left, and so I had to call them back and say, can you come? We've got to do this all over again. And I thought about that. What if? What if I had checked the video before I dismissed the, the other p participants? Yeah, what if? Now that's kind of a small version, right? But let's talk about Nehemiah for a second. What if? What if Nehemiah hadn't prayed? What, what, what if he hadn't prayed? What if Nehemiah just went to the king? You know, he heard the thing, and his heart was broken, highly emotional, poof, and he, went, he just went to the king. What if he hadn't prayed? 
I'm pretty sure if Nehemiah was here, he would tell you if he hadn't prayed, this would, this would not have turned out this way. He would not have had the king's favor. Nehemiah said, remember, the, God's gracious hand was on me, right? The king granted my request for the gracious hand of my God was on me. If Nehemiah had not prayed, this story would have a very different ending and this book would be a lot shorter, I have a feeling. What if Nehemiah had prayed, but he hadn't planned? He, he, didn't, he hadn't done any research. He didn't know that Asaph was the guy in charge of timber on that side of the world, right? What, what if he hadn't planned and thought it out, like how long this would take him and to travel? He hadn't, didn't have, you know, map it out. You know, he couldn't just punch us into Google and, you know, and get directions and all that. What, what if he hadn't planned? taking the time to figure it out, how long I'm going to be gone. Again, I think the story would have a different ending. I think the king would have been like, yeah, uh, maybe not, maybe yes, maybe, right? Or, or third, what if? What if Nehemiah had prayed, but instead of praying, God, I want, I, I want to do something, you know, give me an opportunity. What if Nehemiah had only prayed for God to do a miracle in Jerusalem? God, you got to do something about that problem there. Nehemiah was intent on staying, you know, in Susa, which would have made sense, right? That was, I mean, he didn't have time off. There was, right? What if Nehemiah had only prayed for God to do a miracle in Jerusalem? God might have done the miracle, but Nehemiah wouldn't have had any part in the story, and Nehemiah wouldn't have had the experience of God that he is about to have. There'd be no story for Nehemiah, no inspiring story for us, no example for us. Well, you're right. and, and, and I think there's more. Well, if, but what if, right? What if Nehemiah had only prayed for God to do a miracle in Jerusalem? Well, that's Nehemiah. Let's talk about you for just a moment. Are you willing to pray that God will give you an opportunity to personally do something about this thing that's not okay, you, you name it, between you and God, this, this problem, this thing that you see? Are you willing to pray that God will give you an opportunity to personally be part of the solution? Or are you, are you planning and hoping to ask God to let you stay miles away from it, either literally or emotionally, right? Stay distant from it. You, are you hoping and planning to, st to ask him to let you stay miles away from it and for him to miraculously fix it without your participation? Realize that's a hard question, but I, I need to ask it because simply and sadly, many Jesus followers are, are not willing to say, God, yes. Give me an opportunity to be part of the solution. Give me an opportunity to be personally involved in this. Many Jesus followers are not only not willing to ask for an opportunity to personally do something about the problem, when God comes to them and gives them basically an assignment and says, I want you to do something about this problem, many Jesus followers, unfortunately, they want to know all the details before they're willing to say yes to God's assignment. That's sad. It's true because I think what's going on is many times we're more committed to low cost living than we are to God. We're more committed to keeping life manageable, reasonably comfortable. We're more committed to that than we are to God. Friends, I get it. It costs something to be a lay hero. It costs dearly to be a lay hero. We're going to talk more about that in part three. I'm going to be very honest about that, the cost of being a lay hero. But I want you to hear me. And I, what I'm absolutely confident Nehemiah would say to you as well, if he was here today, it was this. It costs even more to not be a lay hero. You could, if you want to, you know, say it in funny words. It costs to be a lay hero. It costs even more to be a lay zero, right? When we say no to God and the burden He placed on our heart, remember, we miss out on making that significant difference and we miss out, we miss out on experiencing a side of God that can't be experienced any other way and our new heart will never be happy with that. So friends, I'm praying for you. 
And I want to encourage you, pray God-honoring lay hero prayers. Plan and look for your opportunity. Got more to share. Looking forward to part three in this series.